I'd always recommend that people try and master a talk, just one talk, before they move on to the second talk that they want to master, before they move on to the third talk that they want to master. And and I've only just... Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Tony Nangus here, and this episode we chatted with Damien Christoph. Now, Damien, he's a TV presenter, he's a chiropractor, he's a naturopath, he's a public speaker, he's one of the wellness guys. He's been podcasting for six years. He's had hundreds of episodes on 100 Not Out and uh, the wellness guys, uh, an and all-round superstar. And one of the ways that he has built his uh, following, uh, built his practice, had more people engaged in what he does is by outside talks yep. or talks in general. And he's regularly getting 150, 200 people to turn up to his paid talks, guests. paid guests yes. to turn up to his talks, which then lead to 30, 40, 50, 60 new patients into not only his practice, but he does this with other practitioners as well into their practices. Mm. So he goes into how he does it. How does he get bums on seats? Mm. How does he close it? Uh, what are some of the, the key ingredients to having this be a successful event uh, for you, for the punters and for your practice? Yeah. How long should your talk be? How many topics should you talk about inside of that talk? How do you close the talk at the end that has people come into you? And most of all, here's what's really cool about this. He does this in a totally cool and helpful way. There's no hardcore and high pressure sales at the end of his talk, anything like that. He delivers massive value. He massively builds on this concept mm. of people knowing, liking and trusting. And the end result of that is, is bucket loads of people raising their hand, wanting to come into his practice as, as well. So if you're wanting to uh, uh, find an avenue to go out into your community, if you love public speaking or if you want to learn how to do that better, then you're going to really love this episode. Damo's strategies are brilliant. Uh, so there's a couple of bits and pieces, particularly with how he actually feels people. I, I feels gets people there, <laughs> how he fills his classes with people um, as opposed to with dogs. But how he gets people there to his, his classes is terrific. I've never heard anybody going about it that way before. Mm. Super effective. He's a nice guy. Let's jump on and listen to uh, Damien Christoph. Damien Christoph, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Great to see you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's uh, a great pleasure. I have to be, I, I will admit this, I'll admit this. That I was what I've been watching these podcasts and I've seen my mates on there, I've seen PC on there, I've seen <laughs> LT on there. I'm going, what do I have to do to get on this podcast? So yeah. I was Yeah. Well, after after our little encounter last night and uh, we thought we'd get you on. So it's all it's all happy days here. Sometimes, you know, it's just doing some favors for the hosts. But uh, no, we, we we've got you on. <laughs> Because you are someone who was, you know, podcasting before podcasting was cool, doing talks before doing talks was cool, being on TV yeah. before TV shows were being cool. <laughs> like you've, you've, you've 147 years old. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I reflect yeah, on it too, dude, when I met you some 20, oh, probably 18 years ago now down in Terrelgan, a country town here in Australia. You were practicing a naturopath. Uh, I was yeah. locuming as a chiropractor early days, and uh, it was a long time ago now, and you've done a whole lot. So we want to dive into some of those things you've done and the lessons you've learned and how people can really uh, you know, take the next step in, in getting themselves out there in their community and building a busier uh, practice by serving more people. Yeah, great, mate. Well, I, you know, I can't wait to share all that sort of stuff, but I remember those times too in uh, Gippsland. Finally, obviously, I think you were around at the time that Jackson was either about to be born or was just born. And uh, and he's now, I mean, Angus is going through the same thing. Like, mm. we've now got children that are adults and uh, and that are, uh, Jackson's about to move out of home. So he's mm. about to move out of home and he's off to university. And uh, and so life's so, so different now. But I remember looking at this tall, unbelievably handsome fella working as a chiropractor and thinking, I want to be like him, um, so I better eat more peas so I can get the height up. Thanks, buddy. Like maybe go and study yeah. Cairo, and then I met Tony um, after that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but no, we. Uh, so it's amazing. Like there are unbelievable links. Like the three of us have been connected so many times. Our 
like the people that bind are so profound, like we'll hear Gary and Di and you know, their influence on the industry. Um, and I've learned a lot of things from them, as I know you boys would have learned from Gary and Di as well. So little shout out to Gary and Di Coleman, um, back in Tarelga now doing their thing. Yes. And, um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have met each other. There's no way. Full circle. That's it. Well, how Indeed. about this, buddy? If people, and when we have a global audience listening from, you know, as a global audience as I have, tend to be all around the world. <laughs> but yeah. um, for those people that, that, that don't know about you, give them a little thumbnail, take them through what got you to today. And then today we're going to talk all about one of the things that you do a beautiful job of. You're just such a great public presenter um, across all areas there too. And we're going to dive into this concept of how do I get more community talks? And then how do I parlay those community talks into a practice full of, you know, thriving, raving fans as well? But let's bring people up to speed in terms of what got you to, to who, who and where you are right now. Cool. Thanks, AP. So essentially, um, like, we'll cut a, a long story down. Like we're talking years and years and years of stuff. But um, I always loved um, talking, but not in big groups. In fact, big group talks really scared me. I, I never wanted to speak in front of big groups. And um, after I got into studying to be a chiropractor uh, and I moved to, back to Melbourne from Tarelgan, um, I came in, I met a, a bloke by the name of Brian Kelly and Brian, um, who everybody who's watching this podcast would have heard of Brian. Um, if they haven't, they're not into chiropractic. Um, I uh, was invited, Brian said to me um, at one point, come down and get checked and get adjusted. And so I did and I got checked and adjusted at his practice in Ivanhoe. And then my family went there and we all, you know, got, fell very much in love with chiropractic. And then Brian said to me, Damien, um, you're studying at RMIT, how's that going for you? Um, and I said, look, mate, I've had a few challenges, a couple of lectures that I, and I don't get on very well. Um, we've had a few run-ins. I've been kicked out of a few classes. He said, you're the kind of person we need in New Zealand. And so he said, why don't you come to New Zealand and study to be a chiropractor? So I left um, and my whole family and I were actually, and so um, Michelle and Jackson were, and I were going over to New Zealand. And then Michelle's and my relationship fell apart. Um, and Jackson and Michelle stayed in Australia. I moved to New Zealand and I went to work in another practice uh, with a, a lady by the name of Dr. Sheridan Kay. Um, and so we, all of us who have studied Thompson would now know who Sherry is. And I released a space in the back room of that, of that room, of her practice, to practice naturopathy. And I employed um, a girl by the name of Becky Collins to be my um, like kind of naturopath associate, just to help me, you know, get things going in New Zealand. And, and while I was there, um, we put together this program, this weight loss program, and Becky Collins used to date a guy by Zach Dowker, Eric Dowker's um, son. I don't know if you remember Zach yeah. or you know Zach, but anyway, she used to date him and, uh, and she decided that she was going to move back to Australia. And so she left the practice. Not long after she left, I got a phone call I'm asking for Becky and she'd left and uh, Tamara who was the receptionist at the time said oh, Becky's left would you like to speak to Damien and this lady who was on the other end of the phone happened to be the producer of a tv show and she said Damien we'd like you to write our our um our presentation or write our our programs our weight loss programs for this tv show and I said sure no worries can we meet so we met up and she asked me to be the presenter of this tv show and I didn't know what a presenter was and she basically said, you're basically going to speak to the camera. Like you'll be the person who the TV show's about taking people through this journey of weight loss. And I said, okay, cool. So I was a naturopath renting a space at the back end of a, a chiropractic practice. I've been asked to go and audition to be a presenter. I get the TV gig. Um, all of a sudden things are getting bigger. Um, I needed to leave Sherry's practice. And I went and worked with Brian Kelly and Brian said to me, Dame you've got to do... Um, public talks, you've got to put on a talk. So I wrote a, a talk called The Power of Food. And The Power of Food um, is a talk that I still do now. But I wrote this talk and I reckon I must have had about a million slides because the talk went for nearly three and a half hours. Wow. We had about 80 people at the talk. I know, right? I had 80 people at the talk. I basically tried to teach them everything I knew on nutrition and everything that I knew about naturopathy. And I was studying to be a chiropractor and there was 80 people in the front reception for my first talk. And I, I reckon people fell asleep. I just didn't notice it. But I, the next time I advertised for this talk, I think I had two people turn up and that was it. And so Brian said, 
maybe you might want to look at how much content you're giving and maybe you might want to consider what sort of things you're sharing with people and maybe you might want to make a few changes. So I trimmed the talk right down to be around about 90 minutes and, and then I went to a New Zealand college, um, it, must, it could have been a Lyceum event, but um, a guy by the name of Matt Church was speaking and he was speaking on stress and, and chemicals associated with stress. It was called the high life. And I was taken back by the knowledge that this guy had. He was a biochemist and he was a really great public speaker. And I thought to myself, I've got to be a better public speaker. So I went and did Matt's speakership course. And I, spay, I, I think I paid three or five grand um, at the time as a student, um, you know, studying full time and working in a practice um, that was growing and doing this TV show. I paid four or five grand on top of my school fees to go and learn how to be a better speaker and how I could pull together a proper presentation. And, um, and, and it paid off in, in, you know, buckets because in being able to craft a story and tell a story, it meant that my power of food then went from a whole big information dump of death by PowerPoint to a presentation that well, is engaging, but also educational and entertaining. So, um, I, I learned that craft by paying somebody to, to, to teach me how to do it. And, and it was off the back of probably what Matt taught me. I, I now do, you know, probably you guys less famous than you guys. And I just, um, I, I get to do that sort of stuff and, and I really enjoy it. So the power of foods now become a presentation as opposed to just a seminar. But now I've got the crack your stress code. And, and so now when I do these talks, I want an audience of about 200 people. Because I know that when I've got an audience of 150 to 200 people, I'm going to get somewhere between 30 to 60 new patients for the practice that I'm doing these talks for. Mm. Um, so we generate, I mean, I've done this talk in Sandringham in Victoria. I've done this talk, you know, two to three times a year for the last seven years. And we always get somewhere between 30 and, well, probably 25 and 40 new patients every single time I do this mm. talk. And so it's not a talk that gets tired. It's just that it's information that needs to get out there. So there's much to do with the presentation as there is much to do with the way in which the presentation comes across. But then there's how do we get bums on seats and how do we actually, you know, make a, pro, make a, a presentation um, help, help it grow our practice. And so, you know, let's, let's go down there. But that's how I got to where I am now. Well, let, let's dive in because you, you did your training. You said you went from death by PowerPoint to, to you know, over a journey. What, what, are, what are the big mistakes that people make when they're putting a presentation together? What, what were the key things that you learned? I think you said it was Matt's training there that, that you went, the big ahas, all right, these are the takeover. This is what I was able to implement that made a huge difference to how I presented. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you this other one thing that's really fascinating because people that I did this course with Matt were people like Dale Beaumont, um, Taki Moore, um, Lawrence Tam. So all these guys also uh, went along to Matt's programs and, and learned how to speak um, with Matt. So, you know, there's there's some wisdom in looking at some of the people that have come through that. You know, Dale Bowman's kicking goals, Taki Moore's kicking goals, LT kicking goals. So there's some really great, you know, speakers there that, um, that have done his course. So the thing that we learned was to be able to grab a concept. So let's say, for example, I think it's, I'll say this, I think it's really difficult to speak to the public on chiropractic if you're a chiropractor. Um, what, what you can do is you can weave in concepts and philosophies around chiropractic um, and what chiropractors do um, into subjects like food and nutrition or movement and exercise or mindfulness and the nervous system and those sorts of things. So you can, you can weave in what chiropractic does, but most people don't want to sit through a presentation of 90 minutes or even an hour um, or even 45 minutes just listening to what a chiropractor does. Um, that's kind of not that sexy. So it's about finding um, a topic that resonates. So we've had topics that have resonated over the last few years. So paleo has resonated, vegan's going to resonate more over the next, you know, three to five years as vegan, you know, rises up and you know, starts to take hold. Um, and people are more and more aware of, you know, the, the welfare of animals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll see that keto will have its place, but I think that where chiropractors can do a better job um, in presenting out into the audiences is to not jump onto a bandwagon of a fad. Because when we jump onto the bandwagon of a fad and then we become identified as being a chiropractor that practices with this, 
and then has this fat attached to what we do, um, we can alienate a marketplace. And so it's good to keep, you know, if we look at what I've spoken about with food over the years, I haven't gone full paleo and I haven't gone full vegan or vegetarian. I've always been about whole food and how a balanced diet um, is important. So the messages then remained relevant. So I've spoken, I've used this message for probably the better part of 15 years now, the same message, um, and it hasn't become dated because it's simple principles that can be applied all the time. So the other thing that I think that a lot of people try to do is create new talks all the time. And when you create a new talk all the time, you never master it. So if you, you know, if you can pull together one or two or three talks and you master those talks and you continue to do those talks, so they become your lead generators. And you want to have big lead generating talks um, that you master because at, at any point, if somebody stops your flow, you can go back into flow and, and, and continue to talk as opposed to having to, okay, so where was I up to? What do I need to speak about? What was I saying? Um, oh, oh, I said that before or oops, that slide wasn't meant to be in there or whatever else and you can't come back from it, you lose rapport. So I'd always recommend that people try and master a talk just one talk before they move on to the second talk that they want to master before they move on to the third talk that they want to master. And, and I've only just started mastering my third talk and we're talking 15 years down the track. Now, maybe I'm a slow mover, but I do 26 to 30 presentations a year um, of either the power of food or crack your stress code. And now I'm doing gut intensive. So the gut intensive links chiropractic and the spine of the nervous system to the gastrointestinal health. Like that's a really sexy thing right now is to understand how the nervous system controls the gastrointestinal system and how from conception um, there's a link there that we can't ignore that chiropractors can influence. You know, how does the sympathetic nervous system govern gastrointestinal function or affect gastrointestinal function? We get to talk about that. So I haven't mastered that talk yet, but I'm in the process of mastering it. I've done it maybe nine or 10 times. I reckon I'm another nine or 10 times away from mastering it. Mm. But we we'll get there. Um, but power of food, I've got it. Crack your stress code, I've got it. And so it's finding a, a, a topic that you're passionate about, that you know enough about, and then elaborating on that topic. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Because, you know, so many people we talk to go, look, oh, I want to start doing some community talks. But no one seems interested in it. Well, if you're heading down to the local business and saying, hey, listen, I've got this great talk on chiropractic or if you're a Chinese med practitioner, I've got great. Like, no wonder they're not interested. Mm. You know, when you can find it, you know, what are the needs? Everybody wants to know about, you know, stress, as you talked about before. Everyone wants to know about how they can eat better to impact their performance. And then this gut thing is that too. So, so then it, it, I'm, what I'm hearing you saying is <clears throat> stop trying to talk about your profession, but really learn how you can link what you do into that kind of topic from there as well. What about as far as kind of presenting skills? So you go, okay, I needed to change the way I put my information together. Was it, did you learn, did Matt teach you about the quantity talk, your actual presenting skills? Are there ways that we can become more effective with that? Yeah, and it's about telling stories. So a slide for me is a prompt. It doesn't give me much information other than, it doesn't give the audience much information either because if the slide gives all of the information, then there's no reason why somebody will listen to you because they'll read that information. So I have a slide that gives us context and then that context um, helps me tell a story based on what that context is. So the content then becomes um, flexible with the audience that I've got. So let's say, for example, I've got a, a picture up of chocolate in the background and it's chocolate pieces. And so I might ask a question you know, when is chocolate good to eat for breakfast? You know, and that'll get people laughing and, um, and I'll say, you know, people yell out Mother's Day or Easter or whatever. And then, you know, I'll, I'll usually say, oh, Wednesday. There's always someone who says Wednesday and that, that gets a big laugh and it's just another icebreaker. And then I'll start to talk about the concept of, you know, processing. So the more processed something is, the, um, the, uh, the more difficult it is for the body to receive signals that tells it to stop eating. So it, the, the simpler something is, the more significant and uh, rapid the impact is on the body, but the less intelligent that food actually is to be able to tell our body to stop eating. And so I then go into an analogy of, you know, if we're using apples, let's say, for example, I've got 18 apples and I try to eat 18 apples versus the same amount of calories from bags of chips. 
like the bags of chips might give me 800 calories and 18 apples would give me 800 calories, but it's very hard to eat 18 apples, whereas it's very easy to eat two chips. And so two dishes which tie into um, the least amount of interference, the better, which is a chiropractic concept, right? Um, and then I'm, I'm talking about food that has intelligence versus food that has information. And so this is all about, it started off with a slide that spoke about chocolate. So I'm weaving in stories um, with a slide in the background that talks about chocolate. So people then engaged in understanding the idea of highly processing food as opposed to, okay, is chocolate good or bad for me? Or, okay, um, apples, 18 apples is 800 calories. And what I'm trying to get across here is the point that the least amount of processing of food, the better. So I use a slide for context and then I build content into the slide and tell stories around the content. Um, and, and that's important. So the ability to tell a story, to weave in a joke um, or to weave in some humor, just to break it up a little bit, be a little bit self-deprecating, but not too self-deprecating, you know, be a little bit silly, but not too silly. Um, and really try not to alienate with opinion, you know, so don't say that such and such got it wrong or such and such got it right. And that's the only way to go. Be kind of middle ground with the information that, you, that you're speaking about, but provide links to uh, the reason why um, you're a chiropractor. If you're, if you're a chiropractor watching this, um, and if you're a Chinese medicine person watching this or a naturopath watching this, then you want to link in some of your philosophy because the thing that defines our professions is our philosophy. So a chiropractor is different to other professions because of our philosophy. A naturopath has a philosophy of nature cure. Chinese medicine talks about yin and yang and energy and kidney chi and all those sorts of things. And so you want to be able to talk about that in the context um, of, of your stories, which is really important. So for me, my second slide in my presentation says, I've got, I've got behind me, I've got a little plant that's growing. And to say that all nutrition uh, programs are based on a philosophy. And this particular talk is going to talk about the philosophy that I use to underpin all of my nutrition, nutritional information. That is a, that's a philosophy that I learned in chiropractic. And so I say that the power that made the body heals the body in all living things. There's an intelligence that gives to it the ability to hold itself in form, give rise to growth and to keep it alive. So I've paraphrased the, um, some of the principles of chiropractic in a way that people can understand it. Um, so that then when I tie that in to what it is that I do, and that, that is that I'm a chiropractor, and that today I'm talking about nutrition, but they're linked, um, I can use that philosophy to, you know, to bring that back. And so they're the linking things, but it starts on my second slide, and then all of my stories from then on you know, link back to that, that philosophy. Awesome. Damo, if you're teaching someone, uh, you know, we, we want to do more talks. Do you start it yep. in your practice? Is that right? Or do we go and get a venue that holds 200 people or do we practice on the three people that come next week and then the 10 people? And how, how, does, how do you recommend doing that? I think if you've got a profile, um, let's say, for example, you've been writing for a magazine, you've been writing for a newspaper or you're on the local radio station or you've got something like that, then you can probably go for a big... Uh, if you members think you're a superstar and you know you, you could get a hundred people to come along and listen to a talk and you feel totally confident that you've got this talk absolutely nailed um, and that if you do this talk this once then a hundred people will tell another hundred people to come down um, and you might have 200 people there the next time if you think that you've got your talk so sewn up and so polished that you can deliver to a large group of people then go for God but my best advice is that if you're just if you're just starting out, and I did this with my gut intensive. I first did my gut intensive talk um, to one person, and we videoed it, and I watched it, and then we thought, oh yeah, that's good enough to put up. I put it up online, and maybe I think I had thirty people watch it, and I was like, okay, cool. So now I can actually improve on that and and start to elaborate more and link things back and. And now I'll I'll have I'm doing this gut intensive talk in a couple of days. What are we? Yeah, in a way, like nine days time, I'm doing this gut intensive talk. And I think we've got 120 people booked in to see it. Um, and so I'm doing it with Kyle Brock and um, he'll, he'll speak for an hour, I'll speak for an hour. And, uh, and we're confident that we'll get nearly 200 people there. But it's a risky thing to go and spend $1,000 on a venue um, to see 200 people. 
um, if you don't think you can actually pull that crowd. So um, my best advice would be to start small, make heaps of mistakes, work out what works, what jokes fall, what jokes stick, uh, what information is relevant, um, what you can explain really well, what you can't explain really well, because what might seem to be a really good concept on a slide might just go down like a sack of spides. Like it might, it might not come across really well. It might actually, and some of your information might come across as arrogant and some of your information might come across as being not very confident. And so it's good to maybe start with your CAs if they're willing to listen to you um, or maybe start with um, some practice members uh, that you feel comfortable with. Say, look, I'm wanting to pull together a little talk. Um, I'd love it if you'd be part of my um, my first audience, my first panel. I'm happy to put on some sushi. Would you, you know, come and watch it with me um, so that I can present it and see what you see what you think and get some feedback from it and be open to honest feedback. You know, select three or five people in your practice that you know would say yeah. Um, put on some dinner and some kombucha, um, whatever. Um, I prefer champagne or whatever else. Um, but get, make it a make it a tiny little event that makes them feel special. Um, that you've actually included them to be part of your board of advisors, and uh, and let them actually you know give you some advice as to what you might improve. The reality is that most of the time, to your face, say, okay, that was great, that was really really good. But if you preface it and say, um, I would really love you to give me some honest feedback about what works, what's interesting, what's not interesting in this year, uh, that'd be great. And maybe you could actually have a little form for them that's got three or five or 10 questions on there that said, you know, did you enjoy it? What could have been better? You know, was it relevant? Was it boring? Did I lose you any point? You want to find out that information and then you want to retest it. Just like you guys talk about, you know, testing your campaigns on Facebook and testing your campaigns um, through emails and all those sorts of things. You want to test this because this is an elite generating campaign. That's, mm. that's what you're doing. Damon, when you talk about stuff using stories through stuff, so I've got an outline of a talk that I want to give. Where do you where do you mine for stories? Um, how do you come up with them? Is there a process that you go through? Um, how do you come up with all the stories that you weave through a talk? One of the greatest ways to tell a story is to use metaphors. And um, and Matt spoke about a book, and I've got it here. I leave it on my on my desk all the time. It's called I never I never metaphor I didn't like. <laughs> and uh, so I, um, I use that, I used to use that book a lot um, just to help me draw parallels because, you know, when you're very linear and you're thinking and you're educated and you know what you know that you know is right, um, it's very difficult to meet people where they're at. And so I'm, I'm always trying to find a way in which I can, you know, pull together a story. I had a conversation with a patient just before I came on this call um, before and we're talking about gastrointestinal function. I was doing a gut DNA uh, consultation with her. And, um, and we're talking about her diversity, her microbiome diversity, and how important it is to have diversity in food and plant-based foods in your diet in order for the microbiome to stay healthy and to get well. And that a high-fat diet is probably one of the worst things you could do for the microbiome. And that a high-protein diet can also stimulate the overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria and non commensal bacteria. And I said, it's kind of like you want to go to the MCG and you want to fill the MCG with heaps of different people, but mainly Richmond supporters. Um, and you don't want to have a whole lot of Collingwood supporters. Right. And so that's what I said to her. And she goes, I'm a Collingwood supporter. And so my analogy that I thought was going to be unbelievable, um, kind of fell a bit dead, but we had a bit of a laugh about it. And I said, what you want to do, the main thing that you want to do here is you want to get large amounts of good guys, Richmond supporters and less of the bad guys. And, uh, and that's going to bring about a really good environment. And she goes, I get what you're trying to say. And so what I'm always looking to do is to try and build a, you know, an analogy or bring in a metaphor that uh, helps me describe what I'm trying to say so that I don't have to go through all the science. Cause if I went through all the science of this stuff, it would take forever. So you're trying to use a metaphor to shorten your story, but to, to give it some kind of meaning and, to make it memorable um, and, and that's what I try to do. So that book, I never met a for it in life, Matt recommended and I, I used to start off to get my stories going. Um, but over time, my stories have, have, have become very, very easy to tell. It's like second nature now. So, and it's amazing how much extra information finds its way into the story as you're trying to tell the story many years on. Um, maybe there's a few more details in there. Maybe there's a little bit of cream on the top, but really, 
what what the main message of the story is is still coming through there. Just it's all about telling the story over and over and over again. It's like the chiropractic story. Mm-hmm. For us three, as we first started practice, when we started to tell people about chiropractic, what it was, it was very difficult. And people used to say, just get your thirty second elevator pitch sorted out. Well, that was really difficult to do when you first started. But as you become more confident and you've seen a number of people and you've seen results and you get more, you know, you get comfortable with what it is that we do, it becomes easier to tell people what it is that we do. Same for Chinese medicine, same for naturopathy. You know, there's perceptions of naturopaths out there that really all they do is prescribe. The reality of what naturopathy is meant to be is to try and help people find a way that they can heal themselves with food with the least amount of interference possible which is exactly the same as what chiropractic is, you know, but we get bogged down in trying to sell too many things um, and we lose the essence and the message of what, what we're trying to sell, which is nature cure or, or the power that made the body heal the body. So it's simplifying it down by using stories. I think nice. um, I remember listening to Rose Keating a number of years ago and she talked it because that idea of a metaphor, it's a skill that's develop, uh, uh, developable. Developable. It's a skill that you can learn, um, unlike learning new words. But this idea of you know linking <laughs> one thing to another thing and to practice with it too, you, you know the things that seemingly unrelated. You know, you know how is a spine like grass? You know, like oh, how do I link the two of them together? Or you know, you could go down the path of saying, well, look, you know, when you nurture and look after grass and you care for it, it grows without the. You know, it's the same kind of things. I was thinking, could, well, you can't smoke so it's fine. That's uh, different grass. Right? Well, yeah, well, different was, yes, but same kind of thing in there too. So that's tones exactly. Just confusing. A bit of comedy. A bit of comedy. <laughs> it felt like a lead balloon. Hey, mate, I want to know this. You, you, you're developing this new talk, this gut one. Are yeah. there kind of a, a, a number of points that you go, okay, I don't want this talk to, to cover any more than four points or two points. Like, do you have a number? Right. Yeah, three is a magic number. Three. Three is the magic number. number. Um, Jack Johnson is about being a magic number and I've always felt that three and so you you'll have one key topic and then three little topics off that and so when Matt Church talks about his uh, pink sheets and white sheets he says find what it is that you want to talk about okay so let's say for example um, let's say it's Richmond Football Club right we're going to find three key things that Richmond did in, 90, in, in 1996, in, 2000 and, in 2017, that got us to the point. So just three key things. So one was that they worked on their uh, mental attitude. Two, they, um, they looked to support each other. And three, they had a board that was going to um, work with the players and the you know, so maybe it's those three things. Or maybe it was that we've got Dusty Martin at his peak and then we've got Trent Cochin at his peak and we've got Jack Greywild at his peak. So it's three things. So we've got main thing is Richmond, then we're finding three things and we're elaborating on that and that would be 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And then if we're going to say 45 minutes, we might go two t- topics with three branches off that. If we're doing a 90-minute talk we might, or a 60-minute talk, uh, we might go three key topics with three more things coming off each of those. So you're talking three key branch out ideas off one core topic, one main topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and depend and depending on your knowledge of that uh, will determine how many topics you can fit into your talk. So for me, um, a 90 minute talk might be two, one or two key topics with three branches off each of them. It's very rare. Like for example, I've got a talk coming up with um, on headaches. Uh, that I'm doing for Paul Bergamo. We're talking about nutrition and headaches. He's got his headache uh, symposium coming up and he wants, he's asked me to come and talk on, um, on nutrition and the influence of, of nutrition on headaches and, and diet on headaches. And because I'm familiar with it, I know that I can pull together three core key topics and I'll have three breakaway topics for each of those things. Um, but because I'm not unbelievably proficient at it, I'm not going to rely on one core topic um, and then have three. So I'm going to pad it out with more information as opposed to more um, content with you know one idea. Does that make sense? So the less I know about something, the more um, topics I want to pull into it. The more I know about something, the less topics I want to pull into it because I'm more expert at it. Does that yes. make sense? That makes total sense, gang. So it's about knowing your topic uh, so that you can speak about less uh, branches, hey? 
Damon, where yeah, that's right, and it, it simplifies it. Yeah. Let's transition into getting two things. Bums on seats, so how do we get people to our talks? And then how do we transition that into bums in our practice? Uh, people actually wanting to make appointments at the end. So first of all, I've got this talk, I've done the hard work, I've got my topic down, I'm all polished with regards to those kind of things. What have you seen that you've been able to do that's worked to get people there? And then obviously, how do we get them into our practice afterwards? That's a great question. Um, I often find it easier, and in my practice, I've found it easier to promote other people to come and talk in my practice. So I find it easier to say, I've got a great, I've got Kyle Brock coming to speak at, you know, at Sandringham Yacht Club. You've got to get along to listen to Kyle. It's, it's excellent. Or I've got Lawrence Tang coming to sport, uh, to speak on mindset. I've got Marcus Pierce coming to speak on aging well or whatever it is. So I, I will, I find that easy to, easier to do than, and to sell myself. However, um, with the three talks that I do now, the two main ones, which are Power of Food and Crack Your Stress Code, we have them put into our diary uh, so that um, there's a sequence. So every single year, I do two Power of Food talks and the Crack Your Stress Code. And the reason why I do that is because people are more interested in food and then they're less interested in stress, but they're interested in it. So I can get bums on seats uh, when I speak about food. So I'll ask all of my practice members, have you seen the power of food talk yet? And they'll go, yes or no. If they say yes, I'll go, are you coming to the next one? Because I've got some new information and I can't wait to share it with you guys. So, you know, can you make it to the next one? It's in five weeks time. I'll give it, a, there's enough time to promote it. So I have that conversation with every single practice member. It doesn't matter if you're seeing 20 people a week, 30 people a week or hundred people a week or 400 people a week, you still want to have that brief conversation and you want your CAs to have the same conversation. If, they've, if they haven't seen it, it, it's probably the best thing. Then you say, I've, I've got this talk that I've been doing for a number of years. In fact, I've been doing this talk for 14 years, so that's what I say. Um, it's a great talk, it's entertaining. It talks about food, but in a different light. So it's not instructional on that, what you must eat um, or not instructional on what you should avoid. It really talks about what are you doing right with your food right now that you can elaborate on? And then what could you also improve that might actually give you more energy and help your digestion out and get more out of your health and well-being? so that from a chiropractic perspective, you actually get healthier as well. Um, would that be of interest to you? And they would most of the time say yes. And I say, well, we've got tickets for sale at the moment, two for one tickets out the front. Um, if you speak to the girls out the front, they can sort that out. And so we can organise tickets at the front. Then from a Facebook perspective or from an Instagram perspective, I'm talking about the talk. But in general terms, hey, guys, I've got a talk coming up. Um, if you go to the link below, um, it's Power of Food Talk. You can get tickets at Eventbrite. Um, we actually use something else now called Event Frame. We don't use Eventbrite because they charge too much. So we're using Event Frame. It's significantly cheaper. Um, and it does the same job. So we use that. And, um, and that's, been, that, that's the approach that we use. So when we get um, our basic numbers, let's say it's about 100 people. Let's say we get 100 people. Um, and the number might be more or less. But let's say we get about 100 people. We then email out to each of those people because we collect their email addresses. And we say, we want to fill the house. Have you got somebody else that you'd like to bring along if I gave you a free ticket? Um, and most of the people say, yes, I'd love a free ticket. Um, I can bring somebody else along. So my number one intention is to get bums on seats. Um, I want to do it in a way that it's not salesy. I don't want to sell to people and say, you know, this is the best talk you've ever seen. You've got to get to this talk. If you don't get to the talk, you're going to miss out on so much. It's crucial. You know, sign up or, you know, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to do any of that sort of thing. So for me, if I get bums on seats, I know that I'll convert the room. So I'm going to get bums on seats. And so I'm aiming for 150 to 200 people to turn up to my presentation. At my presentation, I'm also going to have um, the sponsors. So I've been to the local uh, businesses. I might have the local physio. I might have the local cafe. I might have a kombucha brand. Um, I'm definitely going to have forage there because obviously forage is my product. Um, I might have um, smart DNA there. They might um, have a little stand. Um, I might have the local massage therapist there, the local podiatrist there, and they all pay $200 to have a table so they get access to my um, audience. And so the audience that I've, um, that I've got there, um, they get access to it. And for their $200, they get 10 tickets. 
um, that they get to give to their friends or guests um, or their patients or, or their customers. They don't have to give them, but they can give them. They've paid $200 to attend our event to get exposure at our event. Um, and they've also got 10 tickets. And invariably, half of those um, storeholders will give away half of their tickets and we'll get another bunch of people, so another 20 or 30 people coming from our exhibitors um, on the night. So that will also bump up numbers on the night. So you can see that you can get your 100 plus another, say, 50 or 75 from free tickets, plus another 30 or 40 from your exhibitors, and you're looking at closer to 200 people for an event. Mm. And, uh, and then, um, it's all about telling stories throughout the presentation. So, um, you know, uh, one of the one of the great one of the practices that did a great job. Obviously, Lucy did an amazing job. AP, like she did an amazing job in Lara when she pulled together those talks um, that I did for her. They were they were great. She did an amazing job. And then in the same vintage of Lozzy, um, another practice, uh, Fiona and Luke Tadich out in um, in. Oh, whereas Yarra Valley, they did a series of amazing talks of hired an incredible venue. And the key thing is the venue. Like you want to have a venue that's going to reflect the quality of your practice. So it might cost you another hundred dollars or two hundred dollars more to get a better venue for the night. Um, but that will come back in spades if you provide a great venue with sparkling water and uh, even you know some tea and coffee. Um, people will go. This is pretty classy i'm going to make sure i bring you know joe harry and fred along to the next talk uh, because i didn't think it was going to be this good so we do our first power of food at the start of the year we get as many people as we possibly can and then at the end of the talk i'll talk about how i close it in a second but at the end of the talk i'll say who loved the talk who got so much out of this talk that they wished that such and such had have come who's thinking about people that could have come people put their hands up I say, well, we're going to do another one in two or three months' time. Would you be interested if we notify you about the next one that comes up? And they go, yes, yes, please let us know. And so then we email those people um, a link in the next 24 hours to the next event um, that's coming up um, with a special two-for-one um, ticket offer for those people. Um, and, and we get a whole bunch of sales straight off the bat, 40, 50, 60 sales straight off the bat. Um, to come to the next one, which is in a couple of months, because we're using the excitement and the momentum of that. Yeah. What ends up happening there is that we've got two databases now. We've got a list of people that came to the talk but didn't come to the next one. We've got a list of people that came to the first talk and then came to the next one and brought a guest. And we've got a list of people that didn't come, or came to the first one, didn't come to the second one, but told people about it and they came along. And so we've now got three lists of people that we can then market the Cracky Stress Code, which is more of a chiropractic, seminar to those people that are interested and so we've now we're still going to get closer to 200 people at, a, at, a, at an event that's probably not as sexy as food but it's still you know really really good and uh, and and that way we will get 600 people attending our events in a year at, you know about 100 people 90 to 100 people um, coming to our practice as new people from those uh, events but then those people will tell other people um, about the talk that they went to and that they should go to that chiropractor will go to that practice because of that. Mm. What a great, great process. You just heard it there, folks. So uh, implement it, that strategy there that Damo has done for years and years and years, uh, which uh, in, in, in other words, brings in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, business into your practice every year, Damo. But what is, what is the strategy? The, 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 the trick, the secret, uh, tricks is probably the wrong word, the secret to getting this conversion happening during the event. What's most important, I think, is that um, people like you. And so we look at this at the moment, like uh, we look at what we're allowed to put on our website based on the regulations um, and standards for advertising. Um, and there's not much we can put on our website these days that's educational um, because any form of education that's on our website seem to be advertising um, or showing some kind of benefit. So the information that we want to share to people about chiropractic can't really be um, on our websites. So we've really got to make our websites about how good our practice is and how good we are as people you know, that we're nice people, that it's worth coming to see us and that we're a chiropractor and you should come and see us. That's essentially what we can do 
um, within the guidelines these days. It's so strict. And maybe we can get away with a few other little bits and pieces, but not a whole lot. Um, so the same thing goes for a presentation because it's in the public arena. You've got to be really careful with what you say and what you advertise. And so really what it's got to be is an event that gives information, um, but has people think, you know, he's not actually kooky, wacky or crazy. Actually, he could be a little bit crazy, but he's not kooky, wacky. So we might uh, give him a go. And so it's, it's just, it's about having people enjoy the content, have an entertaining night and go, they actually, that, that presenter knows something. And I think that that might be relevant for me. So because in my presentation, The Power of Food, um, I weave chiropractic all the way through it, it's very clear that I'm a chiropractor. It's very clear. So I might drop in little lines that might say things like, you know, in chiropractic, we look after the spine. And did you know that each of the spinal nerves have a connection to the organs? And so not only are we talking about connections from up here that go to the gastrointestinal system, but we're talking about connections through the thoracic spine that go to the gastrointestinal system. And if that's healthy, then there's every reason to expect that your body is going to be healthier as a result of taking care of your spine. Um, and I'm a chiropractor and that's what I deal with. So then I will lead on to, you know, the next thing. Um, I'll then talk about um, the intelligence of food. And so I might look at a seed, for example, and I'll go, in living things, there's an intelligence in it. So if I get a seed and I plant that on some cotton, we'll give it some water and some sunlight, what's going to happen to the seed? And they're going to go, it's going to grow. And I go, well, it didn't need a PDF download. It didn't need a MIMS or it didn't need a a textbook on how to cure heart disease on, you know, to learn how to grow, that's something called innate intelligence. And it only lives in living things. It only exists in living things. If I baked that seed, if I put that seed in the oven and I cooked it, and then I got that seed and I put it on the cotton wool and I gave it some water and some sunlight, would that seed grow? If I've got a dead seed now and I try to grow it, will it grow? And they go, no, it won't grow. And I go, exactly. It's the same. Don't wait for your spine to be sick and unwell before we actually start to look after it. Let it be really well so that we can actually help it get stronger and better. Um, and so I'll throw those little things in there all the time that reinforce the things that I like to do um, around health and well-being, food and nutrition, and links chiropractic to it. Um, Misty wants to join in. Yeah. That's my little cat. got a beautiful cat running around. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So when I get to the end of the show, I'm not really saying, you know, sign up tonight and you can save a you know, and come down and bring everybody and we'll have some red balloons for you. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, I'll say, who here thought that the information tonight might be relevant to them? It's a question. They're going to put their hand up. And I'll leave that. Who here thought that hands are going to go up? You know, do you think that it might be beneficial to understand whether or not your spine's in good health or not? Yes. Who here would benefit then from coming down to our practice um, to see us? And uh, and there's a whole bunch of people that put their hands up. And I say, if you look around, you'll see balloons over there. Um, our, our reception team, our CAs, um, they've got um, clipboards with uh, lists on there. If you'd like to attend our practice, um, I've got a special for you. Uh, and now th to be clear, um, this special is available all the time. It's not something that I make up just for the night. Um, I've always got this special and it's within the guideline. Uh, so I have a spinal health check, uh, which I have a price on it. And uh, that spinal health check is available to anybody who attends um, um, any of our seminars. So uh, it's, it's a spinal health check. If you'd like your spine checked um, at this price, then go down to the end of the, the hall, leave your name and your details. We'll contact you within the 20, next 24 hours. And, and, and then they come in. And so that's, that's how we do it. It's not a big sell. It's not a hard sell. I don't try and get people to race up and say that, you know, we're limiting this to only 20 spots um, or, you know, it's time limited. I don't do any of that. If somebody calls me up in 10 days time or three years time and says, I went to one of your seminars and um, you said that I could come down for a spinal health check and it was this much money. Um, can I still get it? I'm, of course I'm going to say yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't limit it to just that time. And I don't, I don't make it sound like it's going to be only one time either. Yeah. Marketing is Brilliant. one of those things that gets significantly easier when people know, like, and trust you. And if you've just spent 60 to 90 minutes delivering great value, building rapport, they've got those, you know, that, that touch of self deprecation through it, humor, great content, then people are going to know, like, and trust you. 
Damo, I think we've definitely got a round two. I, I've got a list of questions we haven't got to yet as, as well. We need to be kind of cautious of your time there as well. If people, because Damien kind of touched on, Damon goes around to people's practices and does them for this mm. and helps you achieve the same results. He's done it for our practices, both one in Port Melbourne here at Times and out at Lara as well, with all of the results that he just spoke about. How do people find you? Where's the best spot for them to kind of get a little bit more of a taste of Damo Christoph? Thanks, AP. Um, I, if you go to damienchristoph.com, that's probably the best thing. I'm not hanging around on the socials at the moment. I've kind of taken a break from that. I was getting a bit sucked into that, spending too much time on it. So. Just go to my website, send me a little message via that and, um, and I'll be able to you know, catch you. You can go to my Facebook page, my business one, the Damien Christoph, or I think it might be Dr. Damien Christoph, and go to that and send me a message through that. I'm still getting messages, but I'm not on my Facebook page as much anymore. Um, I've just, I'm finding, you know, I'm getting low engagement because of the algorithms that Facebook's using now. So I'm finding other ways to meet people and to communicate with people. And, um, and so... Yeah, go to my website and uh, and also you could go to my professional page and, and, and reach me through there. But I'd love to help you out if you need any you know further advice if I can help out in that regard. But also equally love to go and do presentations with chiropractors. Good. Mm. Awesome. We'll have a link down below uh, in the show notes to uh, your website as well. Damo, thanks so much, buddy. It's, every time we get together, uh, I learn something. Uh, I'm further inspired and uh, just uh, love hanging out with you, mate. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks, boys. It's, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thanks heaps. Dude, Thank you. you're the real deal. See you soon. <laughs> See you guys. There he is. Hello, buddy. Can you hear me? Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you if you're saying things at the moment. Uh, join up again. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Did you do that or did you do that?